Hi guys, Janice here. Welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to explain how you can start using your entire vascular system to fuel gains from the Angion method. Before I get into the more technical explanations, I thought I'd review some key features about blood vessels that make all of this possible. Behind me here, I've drawn a rudimentary cross-section of the inside of a blood vessel. We've got the endothelial cells right here, and then these green hairs are the glycocalyx, calyx, and this line right here represents blood flow. For some of you, the glycocalyx calyx might be something you've never heard about before. The glycocalyx calyx is a special shag carpet lining the inside of all of our blood vessels, and it helps sense whenever fluid is moving. Whenever these hairs are pushed over by a force, this destabilizes internal mechanisms that signal endothelial cells to begin rapidly producing nitric oxide along with other bioactive substances responsible for vasorelaxation and growth. What's more, this lining is capable of responding dynamically to fluid movement in relation to the amount of hairs that are being pushed over and how far they're made to lean. In short, this neat little structure allows blood vessels to mechanically respond in a graded manner to how blood moves to the whole of our vascular tree. A second feature of our cardiovascular system I'd like to address is the fact that it's closed. What this means is that whenever we exercise one portion of our body, our whole system reaps the benefits because of our blood vessels. The way this works has a lot to do with the glycocalyx structure. Whenever we do just about anything, we cause disturbances in our blood vessels which is sensed by the glycocalyx and can lead to an intriguing phenomenon known as ascending vasorelaxation. Since the arterial system of the body does not have valves, this means blood is able to move back and forth quite freely. Whenever movement does occur, a localized destabilizing event causes the production of vasorelaxing factors that diffuse outwardly in a given portion of the vascular tree. This localized event essentially kicks off a biochemical domino effect that works as a force multiplier. This neat feature of the vascular system allows for a highly directed increase in blood flow into areas where it will more than likely be needed most. This effect is seen all the time in places like the gym, where people often refer to it as a muscle pump. Whenever muscles relax and contract, it causes rapid fluid movement inside our blood vessels. In fact, our vascular system is designed in such a way as to take advantage of muscle movement. While we often think of our heart as the only part of our anatomy that moves blood, this is a gross misunderstanding of how interconnected and complementary the various bodily systems are in relation to one another. Anytime we move our muscles, blood is rapidly made to move in and out of a given area. Since the venous portion of our vascular tree possesses valves, this means that blood will primarily travel in one direction and actually aid our heart in blood recirculation. What this means is that, in many ways, the rise in heart rate that people feel while engaging in physical activity is a reactionary event. Our muscles cause blood to rapidly flow back to our heart, which forces it to pick up its pace. So exactly how does all this play out, say, during cardio? As you could imagine, the larger a group of muscles, the greater amount of blood that's going to get displaced during movement. This reason alone is why exercise that targets the legs is a no-brainer for improving overall vascular health. But I'm here to tell you an even better type of exercise that uses nearly every part of your body. I'm referring, of course, to sprinting. For some time now, mostly as a running joke, people have repeatedly pointed out how sprinters have larger than average sex organs. Similarly, Quite a few anecdotal claims come out of locker room gossip center around sports like football, hockey, rugby, and in a few cases, soccer. One thing that sprinting and all the above mentioned sports have in common are short but intense bouts of physical activity with equal parts anaerobic and aerobic components, basically heart and muscle activation. As stated prior, endothelial cells and the glycocalyx are not terribly particular about what flu uh, what forces cause fluid displacement inside our blood vessels. They respond all the same by increasing vasorelaxation and growth factor output. Basically, any activity that caused a lot of muscle activation and ramped up the heart rate at the same time would essentially help create the perfect storm in terms of sheer stress. Sprinting, along with all the other sports I've mentioned, have these in spades. 
So how much sprinting training was ideal? Hailing back to my bodybuilding and personal training days, I knew that physical activity tolerances tended to be a deeply personal and highly unique starting point for many. That said, goals can help anyone push their limits in a healthy manner. After reviewing and researching countless training regimens and my own notes regarding the vascular system, I decided on the following workout goals for myself. I committed to doing sprinting training at least three times a week, four ideally. Each workout I would do just four sprints, but I would try as hard as possible to go as long as possible each time. Before I took off into a sprint, I would press the dial on a stopwatch and then I'd press it again whenever I started slowing down. Unlike traditionally timed forms of cardio, I found this really helped me reach my upper limits quite quickly and really saved me a lot of time throughout the week. On average, my workouts only lasted about 20 minutes or so. To keep myself motivated, I try to beat by my best times by adding even just a fraction of a second here or there, and it really paid off in the end. During that first week of training, as I'm sure many of you could imagine, I felt like I was gonna die just about every time. Saying I was exhausted was a pretty big understatement. That said, by the second week, I was already experiencing a couple nice surprises. The first thing I noticed was deeper sleep. It never failed. On days that I did sprinting, I would always wake up feeling the next day really well rested, even if a little sore. The next thing I noticed was a sharp increase in mental clarity. Thinking really did become second nature again. I found my thoughts flowed practically unimpaired by the brain fog that I had been muddling through for over a year. What's more, speaking, such as videos like these, became really, really easy. I wasn't stuttering, I wasn't trying to figure out what portions of the conversation meant what. Everything just came together beautifully. The third thing I started noticing was a significant boost in erectile health. While the NGEN method by itself was fueling some serious changes below the belt, sprinting, well that was like dumping gas on the proverbial fire. After I began routinely sprinting, my member felt a lot heavier than normal and warmer to the touch. On top of that, I began noticing more strange bouts of what I can only describe as this tickling sensation that would intensify and force me to scratch them. I would later learn that this was how it felt for capillary beds to start breaking down collagen and displace nerves in the process. The other big difference was a sharp increase in soreness. While my member was already overly full and sore from using the Angen method. Regular sprinting turned this into an almost chronic dull ache. It wasn't long after noticing all these signs that the gains really started rolling in. All of this said, I understand that many out there might not be able to engage in this type of intense physical exercise. Not to mention, sometimes the weather just doesn't permit it unless you really want to get soaked. Personally, I found recumbent bikes were a great alternative. It really activated my lower body, and it really gave me a solid workout that I could feel the next day. While it wasn't as intense as sprinting, obviously, it did help tide me over, and for many, it might be a great starting point. Okay, guys, hopefully all this information spurs some personal breakthroughs and gets everyone thinking in some new directions. Two weeks from now, I'm going to talk about what happens when the glycocalyx calyx that lines our blood vessels stops working and what it causes. That video should be a pretty big eye-opener for just about everyone. Lastly, guys, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.